Hello and welcome to another episode of Left To It All. I am your host, C.M. Phillips. Today, well, we'll be continuing with the Russian-Ukrainian Conflict Part 3. The NATO problem. In an article from Eugene Perrier, Perrier in liberationnews.org, in his State of the Union address, President Biden stated that nothing could have averted Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that it was premeditated and unprovoked. He asserted that repeated efforts at diplomacy were rejected by the Russians, the upshot being that there was no possibility that the war could have been averted and by implication the claims made by many that NATO's actions set the stage for war oh, it was false it was false since the war began the view expressed by Biden has become an article of faith in western media and the political in political circles blaming NATO is now akin to treason or genocide denial which is ironic because genocide is kind of what was happening in Ukraine in their civil war since at least 2014 which <laughs> if you don't know I'm pretty sure I already went over in episode 2 this of course serves a few important purposes most importantly it fits perfectly with the attempts of NATO to justify its existence. If Russia is marching inexorably westward determined to drop a curtain of tyranny across Europe from Brussels to the Urals, then NATO must continue to exist. According to this argument, NATO's role as a defensive alliance is as relevant, perhaps more so, than in the Cold War days. Remember, NATO was created to fight the Soviet Union and socialism and what they called communism none of which really even exist anymore Russia is not communist or even socialist it might have a communist party but it's capitalist it's a capitalist country Putin's very much capitalist uh, but I've covered that in episode 1 and episode 2 I'm not going to continue to say the same thing over and over for your sake and for mine. Secondly, and relatedly, it marginalizes any resistance to U.S. and NATO actions by setting up a framework that puts any anti-escalation or anti-sanctions arguments on the back foot by framing Russia as the aggressor and NATO as the legitimate form for self-defense. Against the Soviet Union that doesn't exist anymore. The reality, however, is much different. In fact, for nearly 40 years, the implications of NATO's eastern expansion, in particular up to and into Ukraine, have been crystal clear and warned against by voices from across the political spectrum, including numerous eminent voices in the West. In fact, it was so clear that in retrospect, it's hard to understand the actions of successive administrations in any other way than as a stance designed to provoke conflict or capitulate, but not build peace or partnership. Russia chose the winter of 2021 as its moment to make its implicit red lines clear to the entire world what needed to be done explicitly to resolve the conflict was not only known but easily within reach it would however have required a significant shift in the u.s posture towards europe the united states was and is unwilling to make such a shift making build-ups and wars inevitable regional security
most of those conducting an uncritical defense of Ukraine bristle at the idea that Russia has a legitimate interest in the broader region in which it is situated and that this should play any role in eval evaluating the conflict. From their point of view, any idea that Russia does or should have any influence in its western border regions is endorsing a form of Russian imperialism. If you apply the same logic to the United States, if China or Russia or, I don't know, aliens or something were, were you know, just surrounding our borders in the United States, I'm pretty sure we would be fearful as well, especially if they had weapons of mass destruction pointed directly at us. So to say that the NATO expansion... Oh, that's just, that's nonsense. That's just crazy talk. Around Russia. No, that, 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 that's nuts. That's absolutely nuts. Come on. Fuck is wrong with you. <sighs> From their point of view, any idea, oh, I'm sorry, I already said that. This clearly ignores almost all the relevant facts most notably being the long shared history of the various post-Soviet nations as part of the USSR and before that Tsarist Empire. The Tsarist Empire. In fact, Russia as a country has a Ukrainian origin. Oh my god. No one knows that one? Again, Anatoly Levin's book about Russia and Ukraine. A paternal... You know what? It's in the second one. It's in the second episode. Look it up. I know. <sighs> Most of these nations, Ukrainian inc inc Ukraine included, have strong cultural, religious, personal, economic, and political ties to Russia. Russia also tends to host, by far, the largest dispor um, diasporas of the various former Soviet republics. And Russia is widely spoken across various countries. Uh, the, that the countries are interlinked is unquestionable. And that their politics and views of security would be tied to this history is really undeniable. Add to that, Russia has been invaded through its western borders more than once. This includes the most iconic invasions, that of Napoleon, and Toby Levin's book, uh, and that of Hitler, which is World War II. If you don't know that history, I don't know what to tell you. Both of which left indelible, uh, indelible impacts on the psyche of Russia and near... I'm sorry, how do you pronounce that? How do, you, how do you pronounce that? He, no, sp speak up, hold on. Environs. Oh, environs. Okay. Uh, let's try it again. Environs. Environs. Uh, one more time. Environs. Environs. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm going to do that every time I can't pronounce a word because I can't remember how to pronounce a word even enough I looked it up. So let's, let's do that again. This includes the two most iconic invasions, that of Napoleon and that of Hitler both of which left indelible impacts on the psyche of Russia and their near environs. 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 Taken as a whole, whether one accepts or rejects Russia's specific negotiation uh, negotiating positions, it is clearly logical that Russia would assume a military alliance of those with declared anti-Russian sympathies that view the country not as uh, the country is not just an enemy state, but an enemy culture moving along the roots of traditional invasion directly into the zone of great historical, cultural, and economic relevance would be a topic of great sensitivity to Russia, and I can imagine it would be a very sensitive thing to Russia. So, moving on, Eugene talks about why NATO after 1991. 
Knowing the above facts and considering Russia's status as a nuclear power, if the U.S. If U.S. strategists actually want to avoid war, then that would be taken into account when determining policy. However, looking back at the historical record from the George H.W. Bush, George Bush the first uh, administration onwards, the United States knowingly pursued a policy of NATO expansion and clear misrepresentation. Rep- uh, clearly misrepresented their position to Russia. In other words, they pursued warlike policy, knowing full well that it was exactly that. The dissolution of the Warsaw Pact and the unraveling of the Soviet Union created both risks and opportunities for the United States. And as then National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft wrote to then President Bush, the opportunities could only be seized in his mind by making sure NATO was vital in these new circumstances. NATO expansion. He further told the president that there was room for more robust role for the United States in Central Europe. Michael Hudson kind of says this best when he says, the economist Michael Hudson says, uh, yeah, with the breakup of the Soviet Union and the USSR, the, the, no, uh, the global economic position became, okay, the United States has everything now. Okay, we've done basically a constant decade after decade coup to dis- just destroy economically the Soviet Union because they couldn't outcompete the United States Empire militarily, so we did everything we possibly could to wreck them. Michael Hudson adds that when Europe saw the dissolution of the USSR and the breakup of, uh, I'm sorry, the breakup of the USSR and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, they said, okay, great. Now they're going to become capitalists and we can trade with them. And the United States was like, no, 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 no. You're not going to trade with them. No. This is, this is our, this is ours. We did this. Okay, you're secondary, just like Britain, you're second. No, no, no. You follow our lead. This is all us. This, we're going to destroy the Soviet Union even more so. We're going to create a massive economic catastrophe in the former Soviet Union and Russia. Have American companies go in there and loot everything. I'm not quoting Hudson on this, but pretty much that's what it was. And that was in the 1990s. And... People in Russia suffered horribly because of it. Amazingly, they recouped their economy. But economics as a whole is a chapter of this podcast, so we'll get back to that. So, I, I don't remember if I already said this, so... He further told the president that there was room for a more robust role for the United States in Central Europe, later asking his staff how the U.S. could get between Germany and the USSR. This was a common theme among U.S. planners in their views of the the post-Cold War era, the need to make sure a new security architecture centered on the Soviet Union or else a German Western European access outside the U.S. influence could emerge. In other words, they didn't want Europe and Russia to start working together. The U.S. had to have everyone under their thumb. That's what empires do. It's always been what empires do. Indeed, in the 1990s, The State Department planning staff was writing to their top leadership, noting that the United States, through NATO, could create an active buffer and organize the region. 
There's a lot of talk about actually breaking up Russia altogether. Um, still is. Can't get into that now. This is already going to go over time. There was significant discussion of the issue of the U.S. role throughout the 1990s. Just after German reunification, high-level discussions took place at the National Security Council and the State Department, where one scholar states interest was pervasive in NATO enlargement into Eastern Europe. Despite the interest, however, the United States had cold feet about making the issue public, specifically because it would be seen as a majorly aggressive move by the Soviet Union. They would look at it like, yeah, okay, the United States, their allies, NATO is surrounding us. Their expansion is a majorly aggressive move. Why wouldn't it? We've heard about the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? We've heard about the Cuban Missile Crisis. We know what happened when when the Soviet Union saw that we were putting missiles, they were outdated and, and whatever, missiles pointed right at the Soviet Union and Turkey. Their counter was put after the Cuban Revolution, helping Cuba put missiles, nuclear missiles, in Cuba a small tiny island towards America the United States right up and it almost caused World War 3 guess what guys this is also causing World War 3 whether it's whether it's the proxy war against Russia and Syria whether it's the proxy war against Russia and Ukraine or whether it's the new proxy war that's being created right now in Taiwan against China this is World War Three. They can't solve capitalism. Capitalism is a system that is outdated beyond its time. It's time to die, just like slave systems, feudal systems, monarchies, all the other systems, economic systems that don't work. Uh, you're going to suffer economically and financially for Ukraine? A military that's pretty much infiltrated from top to bottom by Nazis, like legit Nazis. So I don't promote war whatsoever. I am anti-war, anti-imperialist. I know I always have to say this because people don't want to listen. They just don't want to listen. They want to believe, oh, well, you're wrong because some asshole on, on the news that, you know, puts on a lot of makeup and smiles a lot. And he's telling... Or she's telling the truth to me because, you know, she, they're they're getting it from the the, the govern, gun to government, and so or obviously it's tr no. They're giving you propaganda. I'm pretty sure I did a few episodes about propaganda. Hmm. Okay, going on. Despite the interest, however, the United States had. Oh, I already talked about this. National Security Advisor uh, Socroft. Uh, wrote to the president that he was critical to broader U.S. goals of defeating the Soviet Union to avoid steps that could push the Soviets to change course on the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, noting that moving forward in this way was risking a lot. The European Strategy Steering Group, ESSG, the high-level interagency task force on European issues sought to tamp down similar discussion in early 1991 by noting that even talking behind closed doors around allies about NATO expansion would be certain to increase Moscow's anxieties, akin to poking Soviet hardliners with a sharp stick. I was back in 1991, for Christ's sakes. Putting in jeopardy the complete end of Soviet hegemony. I'm not going to go into that right now. And indeed, publicity, I'm sorry, and indeed, publicly, the United States and other Western nations went out of their way to assure the Soviets that they were not planning any major moves, 
Secretary, uh, Secretary of State James Baker, for instance, told Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev not an inch of NATO's presence uh, present, I'm sorry, not an inch, let me say it again, it has to be said again, not an inch of NATO's present military jurisdiction will spread in east in the eastern direction in early 1990 okay yeah it might not have been written in fucking stone but that's what was said that's what was said that was a promise an oral agreement by the united states to miguel uh, miguel gorbachev and we just we were lying through our teeth this was part of what the national security archive in its review of classified documents noted was a full court press of Western leaders looking to reassure the Soviets declassified documents show security assurances against NATO expansion to the Soviet leaders from Baker, Bush, Gen Gensiker, I don't know, Cole, Gates, uh, Minerand, Thatcher, Heard, Major, and Warner. In other words, expanding NATO in the minds of U.S. policy planners, was a big enough threat to reverse the ongoing dissolution of the Soviet camp, and thus they sought to deceive the Soviets about wanting to move east. To the extent the issue was spoken about publicly, the United States cloaked its rhetoric in liaison programs and other non-NATO NATO structures, feigning due difference to Soviet positions. President Bush told Gorbachev, we tried to. Take account of your concerns. Uh, we conveyed the idea of uh, uh, no institutions in which the USSR can share and be part of the new Europe. How do you think that fucking thing went? As might be expected, the full collapse of the Soviet Union became a game changer, opening the floodgates to NATO expansion as part of the U.S. attempt to exercise total hegemony in the post-Cold War era. As the National Security Advisor put it, in a memo to the president, the United States had to avoid an independent European security identity. This goes back with trading with Russia and the European Union, before it was even the European Union. But uh, as I'm, I'm just going to repeat that. As, as the National Security Advisor put it, in a memo to the president, the United States had to avoid an independent European security identity that would reduce our influence in Europe and weaken domestic support for our European presence. We own you. That's what we're saying. We own you, and if we give you any freedom whatsoever, we will not own you as much. We will not dominate you as much. So we can't let that happen. NATO was seen as the foundation for it. Atlantic cooperation in addressing political and security concerns and to underline how imperial the thinking in Washington was, the National Security Council staff noted that the United States had to determine what limits to place on the development of a common European foreign and security policy in order to preserve the vital North American alliance. The general point is driven home by the Department of Defense uh, defense strategy for the 1990s, the public version of the infamous Wolf Woods Doctrine. <laughs> That's a whole thing there. Which know that the Principal goal of the United States, uh, I'm sorry, the U.S. engagement with Russia and former Soviet states was to reduce their military forces through military budget cuts and 
conversion of military industries and more bluntly and more bluntly demilitarization you don't want competition when you're an empire you just don't if you're a global empire like Rome like the United States you don't want like Britain before us like Spain you can go on and on and on every empire wants to dominate the whole fucking world that's how empires work we do it economically because we can after World War two we had really it, 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 more to go into in another podcast another episode but yeah after the end of World War two we were the global economic hegemony we had half the world's wealth we got to decide what was going to happen especially during the Bretton Woods system and pretty much say and dictate to every other country in the world this is what we're gonna do all right that's how it worked that's fucking how it worked you don't have to believe me look they're fucking up it's a goddamn Wikipedia for crying out loud in other words Russia and any potential post-Soviet Eastern European alliances must pose no actual threat to the U.S. hegemony. In short, enlarging NATO in Eastern Europe was seen as key to preventing the consolidation of rivals to the American unipolar economic power by preventing pan-European co cooperation, including with Russia, that stood as its own pole while the United States would become more open about NATO expansion, it attempted to continue the rhetoric begun in the Soviet days, cloaking their aggressive orientation behind the rhetoric of peace and cooperation. It's just like, oh, we're spreading democracy. Oh, we, we, we love terrorists and dictators and authoritarian assholes all over the world. The United States is an empire. We don't give a fuck about democracy. We don't have one at all. Why would we promote it in other countries that we want to dominate? We're not going to do that. We've never done that. It's never been the case. You know your history. I guess that's why I'm doing this. This is, I guess, History 101. <sighs> Ultimately, however, the Russians were correct that the United States was set to expand NATO. Der. A central part of its vision of global leadership. This was something confirmed by Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbert, who wrote a memo to the president advising him on how to handle Yeltsin's uh, how to handle Yeltsin given that U.S. policy what well, Yeltsin was a fucking drunk and it was pretty much a U.S. puppet. It wasn't very hard for us to control him. Uh, but again, who wrote a memo to the president advising him? on how to handle Yeltsin, given that U.S. policy was that the NATO expansion track will proceed even if the Russians refuse to permit progress on the NATO-Russian track. And in fact, just three days after Clinton pledged to Yeltsin that he was pursuing a path of partnership Partnership in, uh, in European Security Vice President Gore Brief Secretary of Defense William Perry that Clinton was committed to a rapid expansion of NATO right after 1996 rather than taking the much slower route through the Partnership for Peace. When testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1997, Jack Matlock, U.S. Ambassador to the USSR from 1987 to 1991, told Senators NATO expansion would go down in history as the most profound strategic blunder made since the end of the Cold War and could produce the most serious security threat to this nation since the Soviet Union collapsed. In later remarks, Matlock clarified he feared the possibility of a nuclear standoff. William Perry, Secretary of Defense during a critical phase of the expansion, related in later years that he had pushed back in internal meetings against expansion, saying he felt so strongly it was wrong and dangerous that he, quote, 
in the strength of my conviction considered resigning. And that, in retrospect, I regret I didn't fight more effectively. Also in 1997, a letter of prominent foreign policy voices, including three former senators, called NATO expansion a policy era of historic proportions. In 1998, George, George Kennan, a chief architect of the Cold War, stated that NATO expansion into Eastern Europe was a tragic mistake and, I'm sorry, tragic mistake, that no one was threatening anyone else and that, of course, there is going to be a bad reaction from Russia. And then, the NATO expanders will say, that we always told you that this is how Russians are, are going to uh, react. Uh, but, but, but this is just wrong. If your house, right, your house was surrounded. You're, you're inside your house. Your house is surrounded by guys with guns. And girls with, I don't give a shit. A whole bunch of fucking idiots with guns. And they said, come out and you'll die quickly, or you don't or we'll burn it down. Your choices don't look fucking great, do they? Either way, come out, die quickly, or we're going to burn you to death. That's pretty much what Russia has been facing for a very long fucking period of time. So let's not pretend that NATO expansion was not a pivotal role in what Russia's doing now. Remember, Russia's not communist. They are a capitalist country. They might have communists. They might even have a communist party, just like China. They're not communist. They might have some socialist aspects in China. But let's face facts here. We're practically a fascist country in the United States. Let's stop playing fucking games, kids. Let's start waking the fuck up and realizing what is going on in this world right the fuck now. I remember 20 years ago thinking to myself World War II and Nazis and fashion that could never happen again. <laughs> Boy, was I fucking wrong, huh? Gates stated that he gave an assessment to George W. Bush, that's Bush too, noting that Russia had deep r r uh, resentments at the United States' arrogance in attempting to direct all elements of Russian domestic and foreign policies during the Yeltsin era. Amazingly, Gates notes... He withheld from Bush <coughs> his judgment that a significant amount of the expansion agenda had been a mistake and a needless provocation. Omissions aside, Bush likely sought, excuse me, Gates counsel as someone as someone somewhat outside the neocon circle. And his spoken judgments about US hubris clearly could only be read as a warning, but it was a warning that that Bush, uh, it was a warning that Bush ignored. Moving forward with what Gates would deem a monumental provocation, starting stating that Ukraine would become a candidate for NATO membership, and indeed, in the same year Bush made his statement in 2008, U.S. Ambassador to Moscow William J. Burns would write via cable that top Russian officials made it clear that Russia would view further eastward expansion as a potential military threat. NATO enlargement, particularly in, I'm sorry, particularly to Ukraine remains an emotional and neurologic, neurologic issue for Russia. But strategic policy considerations also underline strong opposition to NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia. 
uh, Georgia is, is now part of NATO. In Ukraine, these includes fears that the issue could potentially split the country in two, leading to violence or even some claim civil war, which it did, which would force Russia to decide whether to intervene, which it had to. Back in 2008, 2014, this happened. The U.S. backed an overthrow of, uh, I forgot the guy's name, the, the president, you know, I don't know. Too many freaking Russian and Ukrainian names get, you know, make me brain fart here. Yukonovich, Yukonovich, whatever the hell his name is. And we backed that. And what happened? Ukraine split. Turned into a fucking civil war since 2014 up to the present day. Got so bad <coughs> that Russia intervened, uh, intervened. Just like it intervened in Crimea. Those are the Russian-speaking parts of Ukraine, right? If you don't, if you don't know this part, that you don't understand anything at this point. I mean, I've went through fucking two videos already. <sighs> Jesus. Burns would double down in another memo, calling Ukrainian entry into NATO as the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin, saying that even among Putin's sharpest, sharpest liberal critics, he had not found anyone who views Ukraine in NATO as anything other than a direct challenge to Russian interests. In a 2014 op-ed, Henry Kissinger, of all fucking people, Henry Kissinger stated clearly Ukraine should not join NATO. Fucking Henry Kissinger. He's still saying it. He's like 99 years old at this point. And he, uh, he's a war criminal just like most of these assholes in America. Clearly, there was no doubt that NATO expanding eastward generally, and especially including or seeking to include Ukraine, was likely to become a serious conflict between NATO and Russia. President Obama, known to be partial to the realist philosophy pushed by people like Gates and Kissinger, uh, did not initially push to fulfill Bush's magical, beautiful vision of uh, Ukraine as a NATO member. In fact, he tried to infamous, infamously reset relations between the two countries in the context of the pivot to Asia. Uh, yeah. So Obama just wanted to start creating war with China. Yeah, this is pretty much. Uh, rearranging U.S. power to confront China... Yeah. Obama sought to keep Russia engaged with the West and prevent the formation of a powerful Eurasian bloc of the two nuclear powers, which is what we're dealing with today. This was advice shopped around by Kissinger. This is not great advice. Not great advice. We're still screwed. All because the U.S. Empire wants to continue global economic hegemony over the world, being able to sanction anyone and everything that it decides is dictators or whatever, even though we're in a wildly authoritarian society here. I mean, look at the Supreme Court. You don't really have to think all that much to understand all this. I gotta move on because we're, we're reaching time here. Obama was, in fact, widely considered by Russian hawks to be soft on Russia, particularly as it came to Ukraine. After interviewing Obama on the subject, Atlantic Magazine writer, now editor, Jeffrey Goldberg stated, Obama's theory here is simply, Ukraine is a core Russian interest, but not an American one. Obama also notably resisted calls 
coming from both within his administration, from various Russian hawks, Russia hawks, and the foreign policy community, like the Atlantic Council, a think tank that shouldn't have been listened to in the first place, to start massively arming Ukraine after the Maidan coup in 2014. When a documentary filmmaker asked Arch neocon Robert Kagan in 2016 about Obama's Ukraine policy, he responded, Obama said to me that he wouldn't arm Ukraine because he doesn't want a nuclear war with Russia. He added, rolling his eyes dismissively. Oh, yeah, like, that's not going to happen. No, no. Obama did, however, provide key backing uh, to the post-2014 Ukrainian Ukrainian governments. The Maidan events totally changed the status quo between Ukraine and, Ukraine and Russia. It brought the ascension of extremely anti-Russian governments rising to power with the aid of the United States and Europe after the signing of the Minsk II Accords, which froze the civil war that broke out in Ukraine, the Obama administration gave political support to the Ukrainian side as they dithered about implementing the deal. This support was critical because it buttressed, buttressed, said, but, buttressed, buttressed, buttressed the position of two successive Ukrainian governments to avoid the key implementation issue. Autonomy for two breakaway, uh, breakaway republics uh, in eastern Ukraine, as one European diplomat told Politico, at the time, the implementation of Minsk is now more or less frozen. Unfortunately, the Ukrainians are now actually carrying a big part of the responsibility of the blockage. When the Ukrainian parliament tried to consider measures to implement Minsk, in the summer of 2015, far right, including Nazi, forces rioted outside the legislative building, killing several and injuring over a hundred. For Russia, even though Ukraine was not a NATO member, it was not only now NATO adjacent, but governed by an extremely anti-Russian government-backed diplomatically uh, whatever, by the United States. Even if the United States government was holding back on the most lethal weaponry, uh, weaponry, it was also willing to provide material support of other kinds of additional, uh, of addition, uh, other kinds, in addition to imposing sanctions on Russia. Furthermore, the Ukrainian government, in addition to prolonging a civil war with forces that could be con uh, that could be deemed pro-Russian was also shaping the internal political environment in the most nationalistic and anti-Russian of ways, including giving large sums to Nazi groups to train the population both to fight <coughs> and in far-right ideas. In other words, Ukraine was clearly becoming something of an anti-Russian garrison state. President Trump was far less resistant to sending lethal, uh, lethal uh, sending lethal military aid, something he began in 2018. That said, Trump too seemed not terribly enthusiastic about a conflict with Russia over Ukraine, and clearly shared Obama's core conviction that Russia was a lesser threat, potentially even an asset in the greater conflict with China. In 2019, President Zelensky won a landslide election in which a major campaign promise was to resolve the conflict in the East. Zelensky, in early 2021, shifted gears, leaning into a more aggressive nationalistic stance in an attempt to shore up his political position. He moved to sideline his opposition, closing down television networks, charging the leader of the largest opposition party with treason and even leveling charges against previous president Petro Poroshenko for being involved in illegal schemes with Russia despite Poroshenko's demonstrated hostility to the Russian government and their positions via 
Ukraine. At least one report detailed that the United States played some role in this crackdown, potentially implicating the United States in what was clearly an attempt to silence opposition media and parties deemed pro-Russia. Because I'm a pro-Russian boy. I, I get like shitloads uh, of money from uh, Putin and hand jobs all the time. Swear to God. I'm a Russian boy. I'm Putin's lover. I just want to say it to everyone so that they know. You know? Um, what, what is it? Rubles? Uh, I don't fucking know what their currency is. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing really well. When we kiss, we have a very passionate relationship. We have a very... That's why I'm a good Russian bot. I'm a good little Putin puppet. I'm a good little Putin puppet. I do the show for free. I'm a journalist for free. I don't get anything from anybody. But yet, no, no, uh, Russia must pay me. Russia must pay me. Cheers. Thank you, Russia, for paying me. Nothing. Thank you, America, for paying me. Nothing. Thank you for everyone who criticizes my work because that's how I know I'm doing a fucking good job. All the hate mail you give me it tells me I'm actually doing a good job. I am doing what needs to be done to educate. And if you don't want to listen to me, that's fine. That's why we have something called a freaking remote. You can turn me off. You can silence me. You can do whatever you want. Because we love democracy and freedom of speech in this country, right? This sparked a small Russian troop buildup near Ukraine in March. Shortly thereafter, NATO launched one of its one of its largest exercises in decades, Defender Europe 2021, involving three, I'm sorry, 30,000 soldiers, sailors, and airmen from across NATO countries. The exercises were, in the words of the Pentagon, to show NATO's readiness and lethality in interoperability. 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 That, that's just an annoying word. As a method of deterrence. Deterrence from the wars that we literally are creating. So that's an interesting framing. I, I'm guessing our narrative is not, uh, is not true. Mm. I'm guessing the Pentagon's narrative isn't exactly, uh, isn't exactly like, you know, the right narrative. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. You know, the administration's narrative of Ukraine and Taiwan is probably not the most accurate. In other words, it was aimed at sending an intimidating message to Russia. The start of the exercises prompted Russia to increase its troops from a reported few thousand to reportedly over forty thousand, and an obvious counter signal from the Russians. At the same time, both Ukraine and the Donbass People's Republics were trading claims of increased attacks on either side, further increasing tensions. The situation was clearly a tender bars. And by May, the United States was warning that, Ru that a Russian invasion was a real threat. Then, on September 1st, the United States and Ukraine issued a joint communique where the U.S. pledged to support Ukraine's aspirations to join NATO, reaffirmed Ukraine's status as a NATO partner, announced a new U.S.-Ukraine joint defense framework, and pledged to help Ukraine work around the existing roadblocks to join NATO. Just about a month later, Russia started to harden its negotiating position, beginning the escalation of the war of accusations that ran from November 2021 to the invasion of February 2022. Who is to blame? It is beyond dispute that Russia did in fact invade Ukraine. They themselves argued that their special military oper op operation was a preemptive defense move. In that narrow sense, 
It is easy to blame Russia for everything that has happened since. As the above history details, however, from 1989 on the United States and NATO more broadly moved in only one direction, escalation. At no point was there an attempt to do anything other than lead us to this moment. As the documents from the early 1990s clearly prove the entire U.S. strategy and approach is about using military force to contain Russia's influence based, basing any possibility of a partnership on capitulation to U.S. unipolar hegemony. <coughs> U.S. policy has been deliberately provocative. It has moved forward in an environment that any observer could see was potentially leading to conflict and thus can only be interpreted as a move designed to test Russia, either give up on its red lines or to fight. Obviously, Russia has chosen to fight. Whether one agrees with that decision or not, it is impossible to deny that the entire context in which the decision took place was set up by the United States. The U.S. government and NATO more or less constructed the bomb, placed it, lit the fuse, and then acted shocked and surprised when it exploded. This has deep implications for how the conflict can potentially be solved. Escalation by NATO from the 1990s on only hardened the sense of bitterness towards the West across the Russian political spectrum. It seems likely that escalation now via sanctions and military shipments is likely to do the same. Two many Russians. The situation is bound to appear as deeply unfair and instigated by NATO, meaning Russia is more likely to pursue a course of deeper confrontation. This may be what some in NATO want, but it raises the danger of all-out war in Europe and nuclear war. Everyone from the Wall Street Journal to the British Labour Party, Party is pushing the idea that the West should try to defeat Russia in Ukraine. <laughs> like, it's not possible, by the way. It ain't going to happen. Never going to happen. Experts throughout who actually know war, who actually are military specialists, there is no fucking possible way. It's either Ukraine can't win. It can't. The only thing it can do, the United States and NATO can nuclear war and the world. So yeah, go Ukraine. I, I, and again, I'm not saying that all Ukrainians are Nazis. But what I am saying is that this was not something we should have ever been involved with in the first fucking place. Russia had every right, every right, to protect its own borders. And we had none. NATO had no right. The U.S. had no right to continue Eastern expansion. <coughs> Everyone from the Wall Street Journal to the British Labour Party is pushing the idea that the West should try to defeat Russia and Ukraine. This is the final and logical stage of NATO's eastward expansion, a direct attempt to engender regime change in Russia and force it to comply with the NATO vision of Europe and all of the world, all at the expense of Ukrainian lives. While this is extolled as righteous in the West, these days, it should be seen for what it is. Reckless war mongering. Thank you for watching. This was supposed to be a whole episode. 
but the next article is too long. We're almost an hour in. So it looks like we're reaching, we're going to be reaching a, a five part episode series on Ukraine. If you don't realize by now where this is all heading, I honestly envy you. I honestly envy you because that means you don't realize the economic implications, which you're already seeing. You don't realize the global implications, which you haven't felt yet. You will. And the very real implications of the possibility of nuclear war, and if not that, the very real implications of, uh, uh, I don't know, environmental collapse. It's time to wake up. We don't have the time to sit back and say, well, maybe this war is just... Uh, the military is the biggest purveyor of carbon emissions to destroy the atmosphere. We can, we can pretend, well, well, let's just not use plastic straws. Guess what? Fucking don't matter. War. War. Is what's going to destroy us. One way or another. Whether we destroy the climate through constant war or whether we destroyed the climate through nuclear annihilation this is the world you are in it was fun to pretend for a little while that nuclear war wouldn't happen but it's back on the table people and you have to be fucking cognizant of that because I don't care if you support Ukraine or Al-Qaeda, I don't give a shit what Nazi you or, or a terrorist you support, whether the United States, that terrorist organization that rules the world, or, or any other one. The reality is the human race cannot continue to survive unless we grow up. Thank you for watching. If you like this content, please subscribe, please like. If you don't, fuck off. Night.